Hi, ladies and gentlemen. We're gonna start studying for the environmental portion of the keystones. Hopefully you remember a little bit about metric conversion. The middle right here is meters, liters, and grams. As we go up towards kilo, we're getting larger. As we go down towards milli, we're getting smaller. So let's do some practice problems. Over here, we have 10 grams and we need to get to kilograms. We're gonna start here in the middle at the one. We're gonna go one, two, three places to the left. So when we do that, we're gonna go one, two, three places to the left, ending up with 0 0.01 kilograms. Now we're gonna look at the second problem, 12.56 meters. We're again gonna start at the middle on the meters and we're going to go to centimeters, one, two to the right. So we go one, two to the right, giving us 1,256 centimeters. Then we're gonna look at this problem, 0 0.86 meters, again into the center. And we're gonna go one, two, three to the right. So we go one, two, three places to the right, giving us 860 millimeters. Now we're gonna finally not be at the bench or at our meters, liters, and grams. We could start anywhere on the chart. This time we're gonna start at centi and we're gonna to go to hecta. One, two, three, four places to the left. When we do that, we end up with 0 0.67839. Remember, all of these are equal. So 10 grams is equal to 0 0.01 kilograms. We're making an equivalency so that we can look at different meters for distance, liters for liquid measure, and grams for mass as we move forward in science. Make sure that whenever you see these um, inside the keystone, you can imagine this chart. If you'd like a way to help you remember it, you can think of Kyle hates dates because base units, dates cost money, or King Henry died by drinking chocolate milk or any other silly way that you can come up with to think about these. Biotic versus abiotic. Biotic means living and abiotic means not living. This prefix a means not. So a biotic thing is alive and an abiotic thing is not alive. Let's take a moment to look at the picture and just give some examples of living things. Most obvious living thing is the deer pictured in the middle here. The deer is also standing on a living thing, the grass, and in front of the trees. Non-living things would be the large rock, the sky, the air that the deer is breathing, and even though we can't see it in this picture, the sunlight that is shining down. I'd like you to take a moment and look at the picture and see if you can find any other biotic or abiotic things. Levels of organization inside an ecosystem. When we start at the bottom, we start with an individual or an individual species. To make it simple, we're gonna pretend that that's a goldfish. He could be of any type. So goldfish is an individual species. When I have a group or a school of these goldfish, they're gonna be called a population. This is a grouping of many individuals that are all of the same species. A community. A community is all of the populations that are in a given area. In this case, going from left to right, it's some kind of jellyfish, some kind of bluefish, some kind of waterweed, some kind of crab, and the original species we started with, goldfish. Notice how these are all living things. They might be plants or animals, but they're all gonna be living. Also note that there are no abiotic features. The first time we see abiotic features is going to be in the ecosystem. Now, all of our populations that made up the community get their abiotic features. 
Notice the rock that's now included and the water that's now included. A biome is a group of ecosystems. In this case, you can see that there are now more individual populations living in farther apart reaches. So we have maybe a population of goldfish here. I know only one is pictured, but we're gonna imagine that there is a whole school of them, as well as a different school over here, thereby multiple ecosystems inside a larger area is a biome. This picturing would be the saltwater biome. When we get to the biosphere, it is all of the living and non-living things from the atmosphere down to the ground. So this includes basically the entire world. If you could imagine being in space and looking back towards earth, that's the biosphere. The atmosphere, um, the, the land, the water, all of the species that are grouped together in populations that come together to make a community, that add in the abiotic things for an ecosystem, that add together multiple ecosystems to be a biome, that then all come together in the biosphere. When we wanna talk about the biosphere, there's a thing called an energy pyramid that can help us do that and a thing called the 10% rule that allows us to understand why it is that the energy pyramids would be set up in this manner. Sometimes the energy pyramids are done on energy or kilocalories or calories, depending on the size of the organism. Sometimes they're done on biomass. This means the physical quantity of items there are. This is measured in kilograms. So I know it seems odd that you would say you have 100 kilograms of mice, but this would mean that this particular ecosystem could support this mass of mice. That might be one very um, large mouse or 10 very small mice. Then at the bottom here, we actually physically count the organisms. So for example, at the bottom, we have plant matter. We have one, two, three, four, five, six plants. Then we have some small arthropod. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven arthropods here, two fish, and one big bird. So when we count the organisms, we actually physically count the number of items that are there. Up here, again, it's the mass. We would weigh or mass the items. And over here, we talk about the energy needed for each of the organisms to, um, to, to exist. Now let's look at the next slide, which will talk about the 10% rule. 10% rule is simple. It says that every time we take a step from the pyramid up to the next step, we're going to only have 10% of the energy that we had at the previous step. So for example, if we imagine that the sun shines and the sun will grow as many plants as it can, what percentage of plants? 100% of plants possible. Remember, plants are always gonna be at the bottom of the pyramid because they are what traps the solar energy on earth and what are going to be eaten by one step up the pyramid. So when the sun shines, the plants grow, this is 100% of the available energy for the rest of the pyramid. When we go up a step, we're usually looking at some kind of a vegetarian. So for example, if we have the plant grass and we go up, there will be only 10% of the amount of grasshoppers, then there are grass. Why? Because the grasshoppers only have access to approximately 10% of the energy from the, the previous level. Now, who would eat a grasshopper? Maybe a bird. So there would only be 1% the number of birds. Who might eat a bird like a robin? Let's say that it could be a fox. So we would have 0.1 fox. I know it seems odd that you'd only have a fraction of a fox. It just means that there will be less than one fox for every area of grass. So again, if we have a hundred pieces of grass, we would be able to have 10 grasshoppers. We would be able to have one bird and we would be able to have a 10th of a fox. So in other words, we are losing most of the energy as we go from the bottom of the energy pyramid to the top. 
only 10% is carrying through. And you can imagine why this is true if you just think about reality. Imagine if you think of your backyard and you think about the grass, and I'm sure that you've seen grasshoppers or other insects eating the grass. Do they eat all of your grass? Probably not. So all the grass that is left over will grow and die and grow and die. And that energy never goes up to the next level. But about 10% of it is going to go to build whatever insects you are seeing eating that grass. Now, are all of those insects going to be eaten by the birds? No, they're not. Only a, about 10%. And so that's how the energy ends up to the birds. Then are all birds going to be eaten by foxes? We know that they're not. And so only 10% of the energy is going to go to build the foxes, which is, we're going to say, the top of this particular ecosystem's pyramid. Succession. There are two types of succession, primary and secondary. There is one big difference between these two. When you have primary succession, you're talking about an ecological event that brings us down to bare rock. A good example of this would be a volcano. When a volcano happens, it covers over the land with lava, essentially a form of rock. And then over time, we're going to end up changing the ecosystem. So if we have an area of bare rock for whatever reason, we have things called primary species that will come in. These are going to be species that are gonna to start to break down the rock because we're gonna need dirt for every other stage of succession. It takes a very long time to turn rock into dirt. So this process here, even though it looks like, okay, we're just going from here to here, this can take you know, 500, 1,000 years. It really just depends how much material the mosses and another word, lichen have to break down the rock, but eventually they will do it. When there's enough, dirt there, grasses will start to move in. Over time, shrubs will come, then small trees, and then what we call a climax community. If you can look at this one, you notice that what we're building is a deciduous forest. So we're going from bare rock to the climax community of a deciduous forest. The time on this can be really long, 500 years, up to potentially multiple thousands of years, depending really on how quickly this happens and whether or not whatever the event was that took us to bare rock, whether or not that event occurs again. Because even though we say time goes this way, sometimes we'll have things that throw us back. So for example, let's say that we get to the small tree phase, but then a forest fire comes through. It can reset us back down to grasses and then time will have to grow us back up. Primary succession does, is not the more common of the two successions because there's not very many events that will take us down to bare rock. Secondary succession is much more common. What this means is that we are starting with some soil. So the actual timeline to do this is much quicker, sometimes as short as 100 to 150 years, up to about 500 years. So you're gonna start down here with some, some plants included. You're then gonna grow more biodiversity, more plants, more complex plants. Then we're gonna come here. You can start to see the shrubs come in. Then you can start to see your understory and small trees. And then you can see your mature climax community. Again, this is gonna be a deciduous forest community. Just like with primary succession, secondary succession can be interrupted. For example, imagine if in this the one, two, three, fourth section, we end up building a housing community on here. We're going to take away the natural things that have progressed to this time, and we're going to put a man-made structure on top. That's going to uh, interrupt secondary succession. Then let's say the people abandon that community. Eventually, over time, the human structures will go away and secondary succession will continue. Perhaps you've been walking in, in the woods and all of a sudden you come across uh, an old settler's cabin from the 1800s that has maybe trees and other things growing through it. That is the forest taking back over after humans have abandoned an area and growing back into its mature climax community. Again, primary succession starts with bare rock, takes a lot more time to get to the climax community. Secondary succession starts with dirt, and a small number of plants, 
and takes much less time to get to the climax community. Ecological relationships. We're gonna start with predation and competition. In predation, you have the item that is going to be eaten and the item doing the eat, eating, excuse me. This is an ant and this is an ant lion. The ant lion digs a burrow. The ant comes along and he falls into the burrow. When he does, the ant lion will consume him. Thus, predator and prey. Over here, something a little different. There are two predators. The ant lion hears the ant coming and he's excited to get his meal. But the jumping spider cuts him off. He jumps over the ant lion's burrow and takes the spider for himself. So we still have predator, predator and prey, but this time through competition, the jumping spider out competes the ant lion and gets the meal. Hopefully next time for the ant lion, an ant will fall into his burrow before the jumping spider gets it. There are three types of symbiotic interactions. Remember, these are still falling under ecological relationships. This chart just helps you to understand these three symbiotic relationships a little bit better. At the top, we have mutualism. If you notice, there are two happy faces. This, because, this is because both species are going to get something out of the relationship. Or in other words, species A is going to give something to species B and species B is gonna give something back. This is our famous Nemo one. You have a clownfish. The clownfish lives in the anemone. The anemone makes the clownfish sting. The clownfish makes sure that nobody eats the anemone. Commensalism. A benefits, B does not. And it's not that it doesn't, it's not that it gets hurt, it's just not affected either way. So the whale, a whale is an enormous organism. If a barnacle attaches itself to it, the barnacle gets a huge benefit. It gets swum through the water by no effort of its own and it gets to collect its food. The whale is unharmed because the barnacle is so small that the barnacle cannot harm the whale or help the whale in any way. Parasitism, one is happy, one is unhappy. Hopefully you've never had this experience with your dog. But if a tick gets onto your dog, the tick will bite the dog and draw blood. Thus, the tick lives and the dog is made to itch. If the situation gets bad enough, ticks can actually take so much blood that they can kill the dog. So this is a hurt species and a benefited species, parasitism. One more time, benefit, 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 no effect, benefit, harmed. Biomes. We're gonna take a look at some of the biotic and abiotic features for each of the biomes. I'm just gonna give you a moment to look at this map. And then we're gonna look at some of these biomes in pictures. The first biome we're gonna look at is the tundra. What you immediately notice is the very short profile of the plants here. In the foreground, you can see a uh, caribou. And so you can see how all of these plants are much shorter than the caribou. Also, if you notice, the plants are red. This is an adaptation that plants make here because they have such little sunlight. They need to use every moment of it. And red plants are actually better at photosynthesizing in low light. So the plants here make a lot of adaptations for the very cold, limited rain. They're short. They have a color change um, and they are able to live in shallow dirt because very, sha very uh, close under the surface, you're gonna run into permafrost, which is permanently frozen soil. In other words, even in the middle of summer, when the sun is shining 24 hours a day, the soil will not unfreeze other than a couple of inches. You can also see our animals here with their heavy coats that enable them to survive the very cold winters and very dry seasons. This is the taiga, south of the tundra. Pine forests rule here. There is slightly more rain, there is slightly more moderated climate, and you can see that the plants are taller and they've now turned green. 
Next down is our biome, the deciduous forest. And this, you can have both uh, pine trees, in other words, evergreen trees, and you can also have deciduous trees or trees that drop their leaves. There's quite a lot of rain in this biome. And you can see that by the fact that the, the trees grow very tall and there's a higher biodiversity than either of the biomes that we've seen previously. Grassland. Grassland slash steppe. This biome gets less water than the deciduous forest. And you can see that because there are not trees inside the grassland biome. If there was a little bit more rain, the grassland would start to transition towards a deciduous forest. If there was a little less rain, it would transition back towards a grassland. We can find grasslands in the majority of the middle of the United States. Savanna. Savanna is basically an African grassland. If you notice by, by this photograph, it's a drier biome than the American uh, grasslands. It gets a little bit less rain, uh, and that rain comes a little bit more annual or a little bit more seasonally, excuse me. The grassland in America gets a more consistent 12 month a year rain. Hence, you can see that it is greener and lusher, and you can see that this one is a little bit drier. Desert. There are many kinds of desert. Um, both of these are found in the, in the United States. You can see that they have some things in common. The soil is very dry. The vegetation is very sparse and the animal life is, it is more limited and tends to be what we call diurnal. In other words, they are active right before the sun comes up and right after the sun goes down. So if you've ever gone to a desert and thought there's nothing that lives here, maybe it's because you were there in the middle of the day, a time in which the animals are not as active. Rainforest. Rainforests get rain pretty much uh, 365 days a year. They have the highest biodiversity of any biome on earth, um, and they are incredibly important because of this biodiversity, both plant and animal species. But the soil is very poor, and the soil is very poor because the rain falls down and leaches the nutrients out. By this way, plants have to come up with some pretty creative ways to be able to survive having all of this rain shine down on them every single day of the year. Food chains. Food chains show simple relationships. They're very much like the food pyramids, um, except they often do not show quantity. So you have to kind of think about a food pyramid when you look at a food chain. We know that the beginning of all food chains and food pyramids is going to be a producer. Why? Because this is the way that solar energy is getting fixed on Earth. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, aren't there some food chains that don't have plants at the beginning? You're right, but we're not gonna focus on them today. There are cave ecosystems and deep water ecosystems that do run on other things, but the vast majority run on solar energy. So that's what we're gonna focus on. Here is your plant. It fixes the solar energy on earth. It is then consumed by a primary consumer, a vegetarian. That primary consumer is eaten by a secondary consumer. This is oftentimes an omnivore, and omnivores will eat both meat and vegetarian options. Then you have a larger consumer. Sometimes it's an omnivore, sometimes it's a carnivore. It just depends on the ecosystem. And then we get to our apex or top predator. This is almost always going to be a carnivore. Now, even though this one doesn't have, have it on there, you will have um, things like vultures or mushrooms, which are gonna be our scavengers or decomposers, and they're gonna take care of cleaning up the entire ecosystem. So even though it's not pictured here, just know that there are some things that are almost outside food chains that come in and act on many food chains. Food web. A food web gives us a bigger, a bigger and a better idea about what's going on in a particular uh, ecosystem. Again, you can see how there are many more connections here than there were for our food chain. Down here, again, producers. Always gonna start with the producers. Then we're gonna go up to our primary consumers, our mouse and our rabbit, generally our vegetarians, also our goat. Then we're gonna go up to our primary, our, sorry, our um, primary consumers. That's gonna be the owl, the wildcat, and the jackal. You notice that these are larger animals. Um, oh, I'm sorry, and the snake. 
And for this particular one, these are all going to be carnivores. Then we're gonna have less items, the lion and the kite at the top. And the lion and the kite are going to predate on the things below it. Now, food webs often don't show all connections because you might be thinking to yourself, if that jackal could get a hold of that snake, it would probably eat it. Sometimes the connections are not made because they, they just don't happen. In other words, a kite would never eat a living goat, but sometimes they're made to make it look neat because if we put all of the connections on here, then it would be very hard to see. So I'd like you to think about another connection that you could make on this particular one that is not shown. For example, maybe you said that the jackal could also eat the mouse. Remember, this follows the 10% rule. So there would be 100% plants, then 10% primary consumers, 1% primary, uh, sorry, secondary consumers, and then a fraction of your tertiary consumers. Biomagnification. Biomagnification is when a toxin like mercury moves through an ecosystem. The problem with biomagnification for humans is that we tend to like to eat things at the top of the food chain. So for example, let's just pretend that this bird could be eaten. Let's say it's a form of duck. 